Hey, hope you're having a good day. Uh, joined by the amazing John Shevlin today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John is a pain and injury specialist. He is a, a neuromuscular therapist, which basically means he looks at how the nerves and muscles communicate and if there are any disruptions in the neuromuscular system that could be causing inflammation, compensations, or imbalances. He takes a whole body approach to human movement, health, factoring in your physiology, your emotional stressors, and daily habits. Uh, John has worked as a soft tissue therapist with Leinster Rugby, Dublin GAA, as well as working with the Functional Movement Systems Company in the US and is an assistant instructor for neurokinetic therapy. Uh, he has been based in Rathmines for the past 11 years and is an avid triathlete. Elon, that was flawless. Thanks. <laughs> Fair play I, to you. I went on a quick walk earlier and I was like, oh, I have to get this right. <laughs> <laughs> it paid off. Movement helped. <laughs> Especially the neurokinetic therapy. That's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> it was so smooth from you. You're, you're sure you're a pro. Nice one. Appreciate it. Um, <laughs> have you been recently? Very well, thank you. Very, very well. Trying to balance work and life. Mm -hmm. It's been very, very work, 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 and, and pretty hectic there. So I need to get some uh, movement back into my life, but all very, very well, I gotta say. Good stuff. Not had much time for your, you know, triathlon and, and like running and swimming. No, it, it's, it's very much, you know, not making enough time. Classic case for, for everybody, but getting really sucked into work and really for this year wanted to upgrade the level of, of, of what we do and how we look after people so my, my lunch breaks are just filled with making sure people have the proper programs they're adhering to their programs they've got the best uh, apps to help them with that so getting really immersed into that nice good stuff yeah it's it takes so much extra time when you're trying to implement like new systems into your business yeah. and upgrade things and yeah it's kind of like it's huge at the background. I think that's one thing yeah. where, you know, people coming into me, they're not really just paying for a session. They're paying for all the stuff that happens in the background and they're paying for an outcome. So, so much has to happen outside of the treatment room. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just looking at ways to just make that a better process and a better experience for each individual coming in. So yeah, it's absolutely. It's kind of like a really busy period for maybe, I don't know, another two months and then I can maybe start to train again. <laughs> Good stuff yeah it'll, it'll all be worth it in the long run that's for sure um yeah, yeah and uh like just to for anyone who's listening or watching to give some background like uh myself and john were working together for a long while i, I think i came to you first uh maybe mid 2018 or yeah something like that um because i'd been to a lot of physios or before i hate even calling you a physio because i like <laughs> You've got so much more depth than that. You know? <laughs> Appreciate nothing, that. Nothing against physios or anything like nothing that. Against like, physio, absolutely not. You know, the level of understanding you have, especially with the nervous system and, and how everything, you know, like works is is interrelated to each other is is so important, you know. Um, and that was, you know, one of the the massive things that I learned from you over the years of working together, you know, because like we were working together pretty regularly for probably about a year and a half, two years. Cause I was just yeah, like, sure. had so many, so many, so much stuff have. going on and, and and you wanted to keep training, which is always a big thing. It's like, okay, we got to kind of weigh this up and, and not just be like, Oh, stop and shut down everything. Yeah. Uh, which we, we hate to. And it's really like, no, we'll push on. Let's uh, give you the homework to do as well. I'll keep making these little resets on the treatment table. Um, and it was fun as well. It's always fun working with you as well. So I think I, I learned an equal amount as well. I, I love <laughs> conversations all the time, dude. Yeah, no, it's, um, I think like some of the best things were like, you know, when we'd have a session that you'd give me homework to do and you'd kind of explain like, you know, maybe, you know, your hamstring isn't firing that well, or, you know, from some of the different tests that you'd be doing, and then you'd actually give me stuff to go away and do. And most of the time I do, I, like not all the time, <laughs> but like I'd say 80% of the time I'd actually oh. go and implement it and, you know, do it before a workout or a run or whatever, and then would notice a difference, you know, straight away. Um, awesome. And like just the longevity from, you know, that, that work that we did and especially the, the homework that you gave me and, and all the, the knowledge and stuff, you know, it's, it's massive because, 
you know, now I've kind of got to a point where, you know, like, let's say if, if I have an issue, if my QL is acting up again, or if my lower back, it's like, oh, I can do these, you know, two or three different things mm. that you've showed me before. And I, I know that they work. So I, I love hearing that. I love hearing a, the longevity. It's not just this quick fix. There's a time and a place for that, but ultimately it's don't have to feel this way. There is an end point and you get this longevity, a bit more robustness out of it. And then the tools that to, to help yourself is one of the, the most important things. Um, a, a very good um, neurologist from Prague would say, Carl Levitt passed away now. He was working up until his 90s. But he's like, our job, one of our big, big jobs is to give the person the tools to help themselves. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, I always have that in the back of my mind. Sure, it's Absolutely. like, if I can get you off the treatment table as quick as possible and get you moving around, we're all going to be better off here. Mm -hmm. yeah it's a really good quote i heard before it's like if the only tool you have is a hammer you're going to think everything is a nail big time so like if you're equipped with loads of different tools and you know more than just one way of looking at something Mm. then it's like it's so much easier to solve the issue that you have you know especially with your health like if it's your like your ankle your knee your hip your shoulder your lower back your neck wherever it is you know, being equipped with those tools is so important. It's, yeah, it's, it's having the tool and then knowing what to do with the tool. You can, you know, I said it to people in, in clinics that you can hand me a carpenter's tool. I'm going to make a mess. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. A skilled pro, they're going to build you something amazing and awesome. So the mm-hmm. tool sometimes is important, but it's really how you use what you have. And, and for me, I think the process as well. I, I don't think anyone's ever hiring me really for my, hands-on skills i don't ever think they're better than anyone else's but i definitely think i have a, a unique thought process mm-hmm. being able to pick out go yeah your ankle doesn't look like it's moving as well as the other one and that might be driving your hip pain or low back pain let's go check that out yeah and, and that's a little bit of um trying to bring in that skill in there mm-hmm. yeah because it's really interesting how like it's never not never i hate to talk in absolutes but it's yeah. usually not the area that you have the pain that's the issue. It's yeah. something somewhere else in the chain, right? So it might necessarily be your ankle it, or like, let's say it might necessarily be your shoulder. It could actually be originating from your hip or from your ankle because your base. 100%. And I say to people, if somebody's getting mugged, who's screaming? <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of sounds oh, yeah. a lot of go, but why are you looking at my, instead of? Mm-hmm. You know, we're looking for the mugger. We, we want to do something to the victim and, and comfort them and settle them down, reassure them. But we also need to get after the mugger and, and address that. It's so important. You got to do both. Yeah, because I think there's a, a, a misunderstanding that a lot of people have. It's like, oh, my knee is sore. So it's my knee that's the issue. Mm. And like the knee might actually be the secondary thing. Like it could be... Oh you know, your hamstring, your quad, your tibialis, your calf, it could be your ankle, it could be your foot, you know. Um, yeah, and those areas are classically, I think we use the example of, of a back issue where people will come in and say, oh, I have a bad back. Mm-hmm. And you watch them move, especially into a backward bend. You see, your back is the only thing moving here. That's the best bit of you. It's nothing else is working. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, so that, that joint, that region just takes on too much work, too much load and gets pissed off. And then you start hearing about it. So yeah, mm-hmm. you got to calm it down, chill it out, but you got to get after other body parts. You know, if the hips are not moving, for example, your low back is going to take the brunt of that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because I think like what my experience anyway with, you know, I've been to maybe six or seven different, you know, physios or therapists kind of over the years. And initially it was always like, you know, do these three basic exercises but it was like it was for that area in particular it wasn't solving the the bigger issue right and then i'd the bigger is for sure constantly have the same issue recurring i mean like what like is it my fault is it their fault like like what's going on like what's actually going on having that accountability is always nice i think if something is you know if someone's just woken up with a, a pain in their shoulder or neck and they've had it for a week or two weeks that's like, hey, yeah, just work on that area. We, we won't make a mountain out of a molehill. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly the majority of people that I would get would have that persistent pain. Your kind of similar story. They've had something going on. 
or a few things going on and they've had it for years and they've seen like six other people yeah so then i'm like well i'm just not going to repeat what they did that's the definition of stupidity yeah. <laughs> um, it's like let's step back let's look at this full body approach yeah um not just movement and your physiology but like hey how are the life stressors at the moment um what kind of stuff are you eating that maybe you shouldn't be are you hydrated enough um sleep all these things are so important you got to factor them them in yeah in a persistent case yeah for sure and like uh something that i found interesting when we were working together is like we you did like we went through my whole history of injuries which ended up being nearly a full whiteboard <laughs> <laughs> my, my famous whiteboards in here yeah, you, yeah we filled them pretty well with you <laughs> mm -hmm. but it was really cool to be able to do that like analysis of the history of like you know at this age you know because I, ha I had like um, a scar on my forehead from where oh, yeah. you know I I literally slipped on a banana when I was like four <laughs> and like slapped my head off the ground and different and like there was that when I was younger and you know then uh having a fracture of my one of my vertebrae and like different uh, uh, like radius bone that was fractured and you know ribs and all these different things that happened over the years and it's interesting how when you do a timeline you know then we we're you were able to help me pinpoint of like okay like all of these things you know are causing a certain amount of you know that's stored trauma or stress that you're trauma is, yeah for sure you know, your body's always going to try be processing that until it actually processes that it's kind of no difference into like a, an emotional trauma mm -hmm. it's there it's in the system somewhere and, and we got to do something to help the body process and just move on from it yeah. and that's all it ever really is isn't it? it's just helping the body um making these little resets itself and, and, and processing it but they all do add up or what you'll find is to get to where we need to get to we got to get over these little hurdles first. They'll get in the way. I remember classically working on this gentleman. He was 82. He is 82 uh, for a hip issue. And when we looked at, uh, he was stiff everywhere, but balance on that side was hugely off. Yeah. Uh, balance on both sides. And then we brought it down to let's check your balance. And the driver to that dysfunction was an inner ear problem. And to fix an inner ear problem, you have to be able to move your head pretty rapidly. His neck was so stiff. I had to start there. Mm -hmm. So it's like to help his hip, I had to free up his neck so he could work on his vestibular system to get his balance back to help his hip. <laughs> so it's this kind of looking at what do you actually have to untangle? It's it's very rarely just one little knot or kink. It's a few things. It's like a box of um, wires. So you just have to start to pull them apart and organize them. Yeah, it's like a puzzle that you're trying to figure out like one thing at a time. Yeah, a beautiful puzzle. Mm -hmm. yeah i was find it really fun uh with our vestibular system you know so that's mostly to do with our ears like that's purely responsible for our balance right yeah that's keeping us upright and where we are in space and time mm -hmm. and it's a huge huge hugely important system i've heard it referred to as the master destroyer as a bit of a, a you know a, a negative but and you will find that you know people are trying to stretch tight muscles that are only tight because the brain's like I, I don't know what else to do i'm not getting sufficient information in from one system i better tighten up to protect so you get somebody trying to stretch a muscle and stretch and stretch and stretch if your vestibular system is having a problem best to look with that stretching mm -hmm. then you know where fast yeah like something that i found really helpful over the years is like um I only really discovered uh, like PNF style stretch. Mm. So for anyone that doesn't know what it is, it's a massive mouthful. Proprioceptive <laughs> neuromuscular <laughs> facilitation. Facilitation, right? <laughs> but like I found when I started doing PNF stretches, you know, five or 10 second holds, like I'd literally gain uh, and, and can gain an extra two to five inches, let's say on my hamstring flexibility, like maybe struggle to touch my fingers off the floor and do right. enf stretches and then it'd be nearly be able to put my my hands flat whereas yeah. if i was always uh like doing the typical thing of like trying to foam roll my hamstring to you know take the knots out uh, yeah no that ain't uh, happening or like you know for doing just normal static stretching holds like that didn't work at all and yeah. that, i think that was a, a big thing that i learned from you like when it comes to how our, how our brains work you know you need to 
essentially in layman's terms send a signal to your brain to be like okay you can relax you're not in danger it's okay to move into this Hugely so yeah i think we have too much of this concept of that we're very very mechanical that there's just you know wires and pulleys that to some degree there is the tendons pull on the muscle which is attached to another tendon which moves the joint but it's the nervous system that's sending that signal yeah and the nerves don't touch the muscle there's space um that's always interesting so it's like well what's pulling on that it's a chemical signal going over mm -hmm. yeah but there's your brain straight away in that and chemicals straight away in that and so we're way more than wires and pulleys yeah we're inter interactive brains and, and you can you can play with that you know you, it's another good one where you're just saying that static stretching wasn't working for you it's like you can't force the body. If the nervous system doesn't want to let go of that tension, you can't beat it up and demand that it does that. It's going to give you the two fingers back, tell you where to go. Exactly. <laughs> you kind of have to A, maybe ask for permission from the nervous system mm -hmm. or find or really find out why is that so tight? What's the story there? Yeah, I think it's like, um, you know, depending on, on how much you know or kind of delve into, you know, the physiology of things, it's, it's definitely not one of the first things that you learn about the nervous system on, but it sh I think it should be because it it's, should be it like should be. the thing that controls everything is, is your brain and your nervous system. Right. right? So yeah. it's more yeah, sensitive absolutely. to look at that first, instead of looking at from a muscular level, you know, cause if the muscle yeah. is controlled by your brain and nervous system, then it doesn't make sense. But I think a lot of people look at it the wrong way around. Yeah. And sometimes like it's just, you know, it is easier the simplified view of well, they're in the muscles. Yeah, it's cool. Mm -hmm. And not scare people off for, for who are studying yeah. that or learning about the nervous system. But yeah, you're right. It totally makes more sense to go the other way. You learn about what the nerves are doing and the brain is doing. Um, you have a much better insight then of, well, that's why that's happening. Mm -hmm. That's why that muscle's tight. That's why there's pain there. That's why there's a compensation there. Uh, much easier to untangle things that way. Yeah, definitely. And um like for anyone who wants to understand, like, let's say the nervous system at a basic level or how the brain, you know, controls muscles, things like that. How would you like describe that in like really simple terms? Oh, that's a cool question, isn't that? <laughs> um, there's so much to that because there's so much processing that goes on yeah. with, with our brain. So, you know, the brain might, and the nervous system might be making a decision on something that we taught or our beliefs, or something somebody told us, or something that you felt on your skin, um, something we ate, something we didn't eat, something we drank, something we didn't drink. All of these things play into it to send information to the brain. And then your brain goes, all right, there's my information in front of me. What, what will I do with this? Mm -hmm. What will I make out of this? And then that comes in again of the things that we've been told, we think, we believe, we've heard, and it all plays into what decision the brain will make to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to slightly shift your pelvis over that way, or I'm going to slouch you, or sit you up straight, or do all of these things. So there's a huge amount of processing coming in. And it's, it's probably like, you know, every single post office in the world receiving mail instantly. Yeah. That's it's, a great analogy. Uh, yeah, thank you. I've heard it as 3.2 uh, million pieces of separate information per second your brain is trying to process to just stand up. That's crazy. Which is insane, isn't it? Even like, you know, I heard that years ago and I still am like, wow, what? 3.2 per second? What? That's nuts. So I could probably give you 3.2 million different answers to you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really, it's really good just to, to get your opinion on it though. Cause it forms a good basis of like where you can, you know, start building your knowledge from and like, uh, something really simple is like, you know, we all have a certain amount of self-limiting beliefs around, you know, what we can and can't do. Right. So if you, yeah. if you always have this reoccurring thought in your head of like, I have a bad back. Like if, if that's been going around in your head for enough months or years, like you've probably convinced yourself that you have a bad back. You, and then, you do now have a bad back. Yeah. Your brain is going to send signals to be like, okay, well, 
you're going to have to protect that. And then you, you don't, you know, maybe push yourself to do some stretching or, or some, some considered training that to help with your lower back. Cause you have, yeah, you know, avoid uh, things now. Exactly. You don't necessarily have to avoid. And the latest research will show what the thought process was, was that we had one area of the brain that produced pain. And then when they did imaging loads of brains, they found that people in pain, loads of areas of the brain light up. So it's crossed into loads of different areas. And one area in particular is the language center of the brain. That is lit up when people have pain. So we know that the words we use will tag on the pain tags and increase or decrease our pain. So it's like people kind of go, well, I'm fucked. Cool, you are. You just made it so much worse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where if we can adopt a little bit more of a growth mindset, go, I've got a grumpy back. You're a bit grumpy right now. And, mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and tell them, look, I know you're a bit grumpy now. I wonder what's going on with you. I'll get you some help and we'll, we'll get through this rather than the catastrophizing, which can happen. And, and, and it's understandable. Something goes, and usually it goes for the least little reason, you know, a little, a little turn in the person. I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. now, why am I feeling this way? That must be something really bad because it was a minor little movement I, I make. And, oh, I'm getting old. Or you know, we start to put these things into our heads even worse and compound yeah. that more protection the brain goes oh we must be right mm -hmm. yeah i think especially when you get older a lot of people convince themselves that they can't do certain things but when you like like let's say for example i was watching this video on youtube of this lady i think she was like 76 or 78 and she competes in powerlifting and i oh, think yeah like she was still squatting like uh i think it was maybe nearly two times her body weight and deadlifting uh, like maybe one and a half times her body weight and like good. her numbers are really good and her strength is really good yeah if you looked at her the way that she walks and talks and moves you'd be like no way she's 78 she's like easily like maybe early 60s but like she has that energy and vitality right but you see another person who's in their late 70s and they literally are stuck at home they have no quality of life they're they literally have nothing positive happening because for whatever reason, you know, in their forties, fifties, sixties, they didn't do anything to take care of themselves. Yeah. And now their body is broken down and they're in that really unfortunate, you know, poor state of health. So it's, it's yeah, like our, our joints are technically meant to last 140 years. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you take care of them, so I can use an analogy with people. So if you had a, a gate out in a, in, a, in a field, part of a field, um, and the lock to that gate, if you just left that alone you know, in, in Irish weather conditions, it's going to get rusty. It's going to get brittle. You're going to have a very tough time trying to open that. Mm -hmm. But if you went out, maybe not even every day, a couple of times a week, and you gave that some oil, and you wiggled it and jiggled it, and you moved it, you're going to keep that gliding. It's going to stay gliding. We'll just look after it. So our joint system is the same. You look after it. You move it through a full range of motion. You're going to knock the dust and rust right off of those joints, and you're going to keep it off. Um, so movement becomes a big component of that. And then having an anti-inflammatory diet becomes a big part of that as well. Like, don't ruin yourself by eating crap. Yeah. It's going to affect your joint system. Yeah. I think something that... Um... I think some people think that like you have to eat perfectly all of the time and no. it's, it's not <laughs> that. it's like you know if you if you go and have a mcdonald's or or kfc or whatever and you have that like once a week or once every two weeks like that's ma only making up a very small percentage of your diet you know so 100 like, like it might Would be you're being mindful about things if it's a yeah. conscious decision if you're sleepwalking through life and you just keep shoving it into your mouth it's not cool but if you're like, yeah, it's treat day, like, yeah, go enjoy things. Yeah, absolutely. They're having a the balance big, of things. Balance, isn't it? It's bigger picture all the time. Uh, yeah. for, for sure. That's what I love about how, how you go about your work. It's not all this so intense and you have to do it so regimental. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, good enough is good enough. And um, balance is, is huge. Mm -hmm. It's more positive. It's more positive health, positive outlook and, and um, not being so regimental 
yeah because it's just not sustainable like if yeah. if you're like you can use a car analogy like if you're driving your car uh let's just say you have a regular car you're driving at 140 miles an hour like how long can you keep going at 140 for until you either crash into something or you yeah. the fuel or the great one something bad happens right and it's yeah. like it's the same you know with your overall health and lifestyle and stuff like you'll see some people that i'm sure you see a lot of people who go hell for leather and they do mm -hmm. like train every day and like eat perfect and like all this stuff and they can do it for four weeks or eight weeks and then they crash and burn and then it's like oh you're you're looking at someone right now who did it for a year <laughs> <laughs> we all trained have <laughs> very intensely for a year and then once the season ended this time around i'm like i'm smoked i need a break so it's too much yeah i think like we've probably all fallen into that trap like the only way the only like reason why i, I can talk about it is because i've done it before like mm -hmm. I've had so many injuries, like I've mentioned, like it's because I've literally fucked up and <laughs> just been plowed idiot. on. Yeah. And, and plowed on, which is sometimes not, not so bad either. You know, sometimes as a remember being a basketball coach and you, you'd rather have that player that is trying to plow on and you have to rein them back in mm -hmm. versus the person you have to be like, come on, do this and yeah. push them forward something. Absolutely. Yeah, balance for sure. Sustainability, sure. It's, you know, we think that we have to do an hour of yoga a day. Like, no, like move, move your body and joints for like 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Just move them through a full range of motion and get some consistency. I think we had that before with your neck. Yeah. Uh, with that joint mobility disco. Just start doing that. And you were maybe like three months into it, I think. And you're like, oh, wow, this is cool. <laughs> it might have been three months to get there. Um, but it really freed things up for you because you just did it every, like pretty pretty much every day, right? Yeah, pretty um, much. Like I used to suffer with a lot of neck pain, especially from sitting down and stuff. And you got me to do um, some of the different decompression stuff. And I actually, I bought that that pillow. That... Yeah, yeah, the traction cuffs are cool. They look funky, right? You look like, a, what is it? Like a chipmunk or a hamster in there, but they're great, aren't they? Yeah, very attractive, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, uh, my girlfriend gets to witness that all the time on me <laughs> yeah but for anyone who doesn't know what it is it's like it's like one of those pillows that you put on you know when you're going on a plane but yeah. it's a pump on it and so it kind of lengthens out your your cervical spine your neck and then you know you can it just helps reduce like um what would you say like maybe some of the the inflammation that happens between the vertebrae or it's kind of like you know, a lot, for a lot of us, certainly at a certain age in our in our life, I'm going to include myself in this bracket, that we suffer more from joint compression. Yeah. So not actually things touching, but being a bit closer than the body would like. And that, that in itself is an irritant. So it's going to block movement in there. But also, especially in the spine, it's going to block the nerves somewhat. So it could be like, it's not that something is completely blocking a hose pipe and it's completely folded in and bent, but there's a small kink in it. You're still getting water flow, but you're not getting sufficient water flow. And if you're trying to do something at the garden, it's going to piss you off. Your body is no different. You're like, ah, I need more neural flow here. Mm -hmm. So if we can gain a little bit more length and space into the joints, you get more neural flow. Your muscles work better, more efficiently with that as well. You're probably going to get your lymph and lymphatic system to work more efficiently as well, which is a huge component of your immune system. Yeah. And that's the majority of people I meet. They're, they are stretching and stretching and stretching. I'm like, but you have a joint restriction. You can't stretch that. You have to decompress it. You have to mobilize that. And the joint has more receptors than any muscle will have. So it's more important. It has more say uh, to the brain. Mm hmm yeah it's really interesting with uh decompression stuff what what do you feel like are some of your favorites like overall would it be like you know hanging out of a bar or you know doing the the neck one or like what would be some of your favorite kind of movements i'd say that the, the neck one's really specific we, we probably yeah. do need it or a lot of people need it but actually kind of getting lumbar spine decompressed is is huge for, for people um that, yeah hanging is great but you're probably not going to get a huge, unless you're used to hanging your hands off a bar, you, yeah. you might not get that much time and duration under it. Um, so there's a couple of methods of, you know, there's loads on 
YouTube and there's good ones on YouTube of draping yourself over the couch or um, letting your legs hang off the side of a bed. Mm-hmm. So it's your legs are just gently pulling on your lumbar spine and your, your torso is on the surface. Um, in clinic, I give people a power band. So these really, you know, thick, um, big loops of rubber bands, not your normal exercise type bands or Pilates bands. And I just show them simple ways to wrap that around their pelvis, crisscross it, wrap it around your legs and just stretch yourself out. Um, and it's so easy to do. And the majority of people, they try it and they just go, Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> Relief. <laughs> I'm like, well, I just leave you here for a few minutes. I'll go get a coffee. They're like, yeah, sure, whatever. This is heaven. Um, for a couple of minutes. Of, and, and that's where, we, yeah, that is probably something we should be doing like, a few times a week, especially if we are in a job where we sit a lot. We're going to put a lot of pressure through our lumbar spine. Mm-hmm. So to, to decompress that is is delicious. That would be the main area. We, we do it for your upper um mid spine as well and shoulders and hips lovely way to use a band as well um you can actually get a lot from standing one leg on a step dangling your other leg off and just shaking your leg as if you're you know you're trying to shake water off your body yeah i remember actually that same um urologist from from prague dr carl levitt that i was telling you about earlier years ago i bought one of his uh, dvds I was so excited. Yeah, he's one of the top. He was one of the top guys in manual medicine. Oh mm-hmm. my God, I'm going to learn such amazing techniques here. And went to the section of joints and he was like, shake the joint. I was like, that's it? You just shake the joint of the person on the table? There was nothing fancy to it at all. But so effective. Yeah, I think that's how you know you're old when you went and bought a DVD for something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's so true. It might have been a download, but yeah, <laughs> that's going right back there. It's like DVD. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, like, I remember having videotapes when I was younger, so it shows how old I am nearly. <laughs> there we go. Oh my God, Ian, I'm surprised by that. <laughs> you know what a VHS is? Yeah, I know. That's crazy. <laughs> had, had Thomas the Tank Engine on VHS when I was like four. <laughs> good memories though right yeah um but yeah like those are some some really I like and i've done some of those decompressions as well the one where you let your leg hang that works mm. amazing like um because i had um sciatica for a while and in my right hip and i literally just stand on one step with my left leg and i'd let the right one i just let it hang hang yeah i just stand there for a minute and um you showed me that one and that works so well like that literally um would get rid of the sciatica and anytime i feel it coming back now um i literally would just do that and it yeah. kind of goes um and it's it's usually a bit of a delayed effect so if i'm experiencing pain like today and i do it um it's like tomorrow that i'll wake up and like oh yeah it's like magic it's gone yeah but the delayed effect is such a thing isn't it of you know, if, the, if something would happen to you instantly, yeah. Um, in terms of maybe a positive change, there probably wasn't that much wrong in the first place. There's probably a life stressor in there, in that kind of way, or like instant stuff is like that, or getting a surgery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and even if that's not going to be that instant, so it's um, yeah. when these things have a, an accumulative effect, and they, you know, you feel it the next day, you feel it in a couple of days' time. Mm-hmm. yeah and that's when you know it's 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 a, it's a real thing then the other one that you mentioned as well like uh because I, I know for for some people listen like like lower back and and like so lumbar is is the lower part of your back just for anyone who's correct there. but like lower back issues are are common for many people so those are the ones you mentioned where like if you're lying on a bed would you let like let's say your your right leg hang off the side of the bed or would you like uh, let maybe both your legs hang off the bottom of yeah, the you Yeah, do, do both legs. So you would be belly down as well. So you're more in a flexed position to do that. Yeah. Uh, and you're just trying to take the, the weight there. So let your legs go as heavy as possible. You're going to end up like with your torso on the bed, your legs hanging, like your thighs hanging straight down off the side of the bed. Right. And then your knees are going to be bent. You're going to have a kind of 90 degree angle. Mm-hmm. So your le- your legs are more almost like on the floor, kind of a, a shape. Yeah. 
that's a Sorry. good visual into that but that's one, one technique without having to go get a get a band sometimes you got to just find what works for you that's a, yeah. a very much like they're all gonna the things that we discussed are all going to decompress your low back it's just what works for each individual you, yeah. you just never know until you really test it so sometimes mm -hmm. i give people hey look here's option a here's option b here's option c whatever one feels best or is easiest for you to achieve and do that's the one for you yeah that's really important like because everyone's you know physiology is slightly different so it's like you might give somebody three and they'll find maybe that the third one works best and the other yeah. two maybe they don't feel as much for whatever reason no i think that's it's a huge part isn't it of not just going hey this is the thing to do yeah I, I always get them in clinic where people go, especially for backs, like, oh, what about what about swimming for my back? My, my doctor <laughs> told me to swim. First thing out of my mouth is like, do you like swimming? And I go, no. I said, well, then, no, that's not the right thing for you. <laughs> it's not going to work because you're never going to go. Yeah. It, is swimming good for someone's back? Yeah, but not if they're not going to go and they don't like it. It's going to just add to a horrible experience for them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes there is a few little hey you just gotta you just gotta do this and suck it up for a little bit but it's only going to be a couple of weeks and ultimately we move towards okay for longevity what do you like doing what's like a, a no friction as um my good friend strength and edition coach uh, john o'connell would say like zero friction like, that's yeah. what we really want to want to go for for that sustainability no i completely agree with that you want to make it so easy that like it just makes complete sense to go and do it because it's like it's that easy or that simple like yeah. make it stupid simple like uh if like yesterday i had a call with this lady and she was like oh i need to get my steps back up and i was like well you don't need to do ten thousand steps like what are you doing right now and she was like oh i'm pretty around three thousand i was like okay yeah well, <laughs> you know, we'll aim for between three to five thousand so for now just and then, a small change yeah, like it doesn't have to be this huge, you know, big, you know, change that you make. No, certainly not. Not everyone needs to run a marathon, you know, it's like mm -hmm. go for yeah. a brisk walk. <laughs> and, and speaking about marathons, uh, you completed, uh, I don't know how many marathons, but you did, was the last one you did the Dublin one or? It was Dublin, yeah. I've only actually done, done one in 2019. It was uh, years of saying I will never do a marathon. Yeah. my background is in basketball i was like maybe if i could bring a ball with me and just like throw <laughs> it and run after it i might get around that way <laughs> throw it at people along the way <laughs> but it kind of shows you like going back into what we're saying of like our thoughts and beliefs i really thought that that that's um, my physiology is not geared for running a marathon i'm i'm a basketball player I've done that since i'm 11 so it's very stop start springy type stuff um but then just got it into my head to go go do it and train for one. And I could almost feel my DNA initially resisting and then transitioning and going, yeah, sure. And, you know, what a, a sign of what you, you can do at that point. Well, maybe, yeah, a couple of months before that, I, I hadn't worked out for years. I was really out of shape. Um, my body was not happy with anything. So for me to even try run 5K, I was in, like, that wasn't happening. I had to do it. I think I had to do 1K three times with rests in between. And then I'd be like, I'm done. I'm smoked. Yeah. You see, you go from there to just slowly building it up. And like, oh, yeah, I'll do a marathon. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then once you get there, it's easier to keep it going and sustain it. Actually, it doesn't take as much work. I think that's the other thing that we should always be pointing out. It's like, yeah, you're going to have this steep upward curve. But once you get there, it's not too bad to maintain it. You don't have to do half the amount of work to maintain it. For sure. Yeah. The hard thing is just to get there. But once you've done that, your body has made all the necessary adaptations that it's needed. Um, it's just, yeah, you're going to keep the momentum going, isn't it? It's the yeah. same with a car. The most, you know, the most fuel you're going to use when you're in first gear taken off. It's going to dump a load of fuel into the engine. You get onto the M50 and you're tipping away, barely using that much fuel. Mm -hmm. Our bodies are going to be similar in that sort of sense. Yeah, definitely. And like with your, uh, you know, the marathon prep, um, because you did it in like around the four hour mark, right? Yeah, that was just under four hours. I wasted a lot of time peeing. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you really did it in two and a half, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I drank way too much the days leading up to it, where I'm, I'm not a huge one for, you know, three liters of water a day. I'm like, that doesn't suit me. 
yeah. just doesn't, doesn't do any different for me but I, that's what i tried to do i super hydrated that was super silly <laughs> and with your prep so like when you started at that like the three sets of 1k runs like what was the the time from you know uh let's say the date of when you were doing those 1k runs up to the marathon like what was that time frame yeah like? when i started doing that uh, it was the, the 1k runs was 2018 prepping for a triathlon yeah i'd, I'd started to kind of say well I, I really need to do some sort of extra movement here i'm talking to people so much about movement and i'm sitting here really unfit I just felt like that's not cool so it's like well I, and i'd also was thinking i'd love to run because I, I get a good few runners in and i want to feel and experience what they're feeling so i started to do that and i started to cycle in to work it was a short cycle but i hadn't cycled in for ages so I thought, man, the weather's really nice it's 2018 so it was a pretty good summer started to cycle into work um my girlfriend was training for a big swim i said i'll jump in the water with you and try it and i couldn't swim and it, that didn't impress me i was like i need to figure i want to figure out how to swim and then she was like hey it sounds like you're doing a triathlon there four, four weeks out from the dublin city triathlon she sends me the, the link and i sneakily booked and registered for it didn't tell her for a week and uh, so she thought i missed the cutoff date i was like nope i booked in <laughs> and then i scared the shit out of myself i was like okay this is in four weeks time and you're so out of shape like you can't even run one kilometer <laughs> so just had to like chip away at that that was would have been like august september of 2018 so then just, you know, got, got into triathlon, got into training and, and doing different things um, and then start training maybe like summer of 2019 for the, for the Dublin marathon. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, the, the, the fitness was, was much better then. Nice. And so between like when you done the triathlon, uh, like August or September of 2018, up until the summer, what was the, what was your, your gain? Like, did you go up from, you know, did you get up to doing like, let's say, um a 20 miler or you know 22 or like what did you get up to before the marathon oh what did i end up doing i think ky a mile wise was 17 i nice. was like i'm not doing 20k or the 20 mile runs the 22 mile runs these long runs i'm like nah i'm gonna try do it a different way so no crazy long runs i did one 17 miler i did one 16 miler um, I trained a lot in barefoot shoes. So the thought process was if I can run 17 miles in virtually my bare feet over mm -hmm. whatever surface, um, I think I can run the 26 uh, uh, miles in nice, comfy shoes. Nice. And it worked out really well. There was no hitting the wall at mile 20 or 22. It was like, yeah, whatever, just keep plugging away and, mm -hmm. um, it was it wasn't like it wasn't so painful maybe i should have ran faster <laughs> yeah like that's a very good sign i mean like if you were to do it again and you you did enough prep like you could probably you know hit around the 350 or 345 depending on how well the prep went yeah i was kind of like a i can't remember what i was a 350 something i think i was nice. but, but yeah literally stopped i think like 15 minutes pee <laughs> <laughs> so it would have been way better so um you just yeah, have to, hey, you'll have to wet yourself the next time you go around to say <laughs> yeah exactly i need to learn he on the go yeah exactly like, do anything like you would yeah. like like they do in the uh the full distance iron man oh there's no getting off the bike <laughs> that so is P on the bike <laughs> yes yeah um the things we do and the things we have to do are crazy aren't they yeah, what you mentioned about, you know, uh, barefoot shoes, it just reminded me, um, you know, because in the past, I used to have the thought of like, oh, I have to wear supported shoes for my yes. feet. And like, I'd go for runs and I'd be wearing like Asics and uh, I think I had like GT 2000s or something. And I'd go for a run and like, just felt awful. And then mm -hmm. I think, um, I think I'd maybe been working with you for a while I think you'd suggested maybe trying something different. So I ended up changing to a Nike free run and they're just a really oh, like, yeah. really so flexible, 
flexible a shoe, super comfortable. And as soon as I switched over, literally within a couple of days, going from the supported, you know, arch supported mm. shoes to the free run, like even just walking around, I was like, oh my God, these are so much better. So and much nicer, right? and yeah. then I started to do longer runs and like, I've never really been that interested in endurance at all, but I was like, oh, I want to see how far I can take this. And then eventually cool. it's the point where did like a half marathon just by myself well cool wearing the nike free runs and awesome i got to the end of it i was like my feet feel so good right now it's like yeah it was just everywhere else you know it was my quads and hips and yeah that. for sure right they don't but, take the brunt of it yeah i think that's maybe something people need to think about more is like do you actually need to wear this really well supported shoe yeah. or is the underlying issue actually the fact that you need to strengthen up your feet and make them stronger first instead of 100 percent, and get that adaptability and i get we have such busy lives and sometimes because to do that you would have to do that foundational supplemental work to, to get your feet strong enough and to take the time to adapt to get to that kind of barefoot level and some people just don't have the time and yeah. one of the joys i suppose about running is that you just stick your shoes and shorts on and you're out the door for most people, it might not be the most ideal thing. You try and warm up, but yeah, warm up, dude. <laughs> warm up. It takes seven to twelve minutes for the blood to leave your organs and get to the working muscles. So if you don't warm up properly, shit gonna bite you. Do your warm up, <laughs> or you're gonna have a horrible life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you know, it, it's maybe like some people would need a supported shoot for the convenience of it. Mm -hmm. But if they do transition and work towards getting their feet more adapted to the load and stronger and whatnot, I think they'll just have a nicer experience. Yeah. Running. They just, they, they, things just, as you said, they just feel nicer, don't they? You, you kind of can feel, you feel your hips moving more freely and muscles firing up and waking up. It's a much more natural experience. Yeah. If you look at a couple of things on that, it's, there's so many joints in your foot and joints are, no matter where we see them in life, meant to move. You know, the more hinges on a door, the more movement that door is meant to have. Um, when we so much, so many joints in our foot, it's designed for movement. It's not designed to be locked up mm -hmm. in a in a really tight whatever shoe. Yeah. Um, or you look at kids. You, you know, kids like two, three years of age, and go to the beach or the park. The first thing you know, for my young lad when he was at, at that age, Zach was like, "Can I take my shoes off?" Like, yeah, take your shoes and socks off. And he wants that feeling and experience through his foot. Each foot is 200,000 receptors oh, per wow. foot. And it's, so you'd imagine going through life wearing gloves nonstop. I know. Virtually nonstop. Nothing would feel how it actually is. You're depriving your sensory system of something huge. And we do that with our feet all the time. Yeah, just spend a little bit more time barefoot and proper, like you know, don't even put the sock on around the house, just barefoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you even look at what it does to your toes, you know, naturally your your toes should be splayed out to really yeah. strength and balance for your for everything, you know. Because if your if your foot strength is off, then it's going to affect your knee, your hip, your shoulder, your whole system. So if you have that's your foundation, right? that's, our, that's our contact with the world that's having us mm -hmm. mystically. You need to have that good solid foundation. Yeah, because like if you look at your feet after wearing like tight shoes or like uh, if you're a woman and you wear like really high heels or maybe you're a man and you wear high heels. It's good save. <laughs> <laughs> good save. But just using that as an example, like your toes are literally stuck together after wearing something really tight. Yeah. And like if it's nearly impossible to balance if all your toes are like all stuck together. No and, balance like, whatsoever. I saw this cool video on like, you know, some whatever I was watching on Instagram, it's full of like movements and, and whatnot. But it was someone put a, like a pen or a pencil, not the sharpest, to a baby's foot and their foot just went... <clears throat> grabbed it like a hand it was so hand like it was like yeah. that's that's what it's supposed to do it has that same ability and just look how rigid like our mm. feet have become it's cruel really yeah so it's it's probably like a a thing to to think about or challenge it's like do you need to rely on on this support that you have or in an ideal yeah. world if you can put a bit of time into it you know could you end up performing better 
feeling better um, by actually just doing a bit of extra work on your foot strength and not worrying yeah. so much about having to wear, you know, these really supported shoes all the time. Um, it won't work for everybody, obviously, but it's like for yeah. some people, it will. Yeah, and because the majority of people do not have flat feet. They have feet that flatten, mm -hmm. but they're not flat. You know, you, you take them off their feet and sit them at the edge of the, the treatment table and dangle their foot. They're holding their foot like this, you know, nice arch. Yeah. But they put their weight through it. That's a foot that flattens, not a flat foot. Yeah. Don't, you don't need to support that. You need to invigorate that. Give it something to do. It's bored. Um, and, you, you know, those overly supported shoes and, and insoles are ultimately going to weaken the muscles of your feet. You can't just go around carrying it. If you carried someone, or my analogy is when the astronauts go up in the space, there's no gravity. There's weak as kittens when they come back down. They have to do a lot of strength training and impact work to get that back. So why would you want to consciously do that to your to your foot or your your body mm -hmm. yeah it doesn't make a whole lot of sense and just putting something in small you know it's you start to walk around your house for 10 minutes in your bare feet uh, and, you know most evenings and, and building it up i mean that's what i did with um training for the marathon in my, in my bare feet um like i went for a walk for a couple of k in my in my barefoot shoes and then it became I'll jog for 1K and then 2K. And I was really listening to my body. Okay, so, okay, the Achilles are pretty tight right now. Go home. <laughs> Even if I schedule for 10K, they might have been barking at me at 2K. I'm like, okay, I'm going home now. Yeah, that's a really hard well, thing to do though, isn't it? Like when you get into your so head and you make a plan of like, I'm doing a 10K today. And so hard. Like to, to actually have the discipline to stop at 2K and to, uh, to take a second to look at the bigger picture of like, okay, if I push myself and do the 10K today, how is that actually going to affect me? Is this going to cause an injury? Or yeah. how, like, what's the better decision to make for, you know, the next six months or a year? It's very hard to do that. Like, It's such a hard thing to do. We're all, all guilty of it. <laughs> but it is, the, yeah, it is the right thing. If we just can catch ourselves and just be a little bit more conscious and, less uh walking around sleepwalking mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be better off and just go hey just listening to my body and my body just said yeah this is what i need to go do i need, just need to go home now or, or maybe you've brought two pairs of shoes you know that could be my, my thing there it's like bring my barefoot shoes start in them gets too much like we'll just swap over to your cushion shoes and finish it out that way provided yeah. you know body parts are not barking at you and then you can get you can complete it that way yeah, no, it makes sense. Um, I'm really interested to uh, ask you, like, what your experience was like working at uh, Leinster Rugby. Um, like, when was that and how long did that go on for? It was like 20, 2014 and 2015, the, the two seasons in there. So we were brought in as soft tissue therapists. Uh, very much a plow the players out of it sort of approach. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, it was very, like, go hard or go home. Kind of a kind of a thing in there um which doesn't have to be the case for uh the everyday person it's, i always think that you know soft tissue work and massage work has to be like dig in hard here like, no it doesn't if you're sweating on the table and your nervous system is ha having a freak out that's not the right thing to do it was an interesting one where some players loved it and worshipped it and were in most days and other players were allergic to it like, don't touch me Mm -hmm. so you know it, that sort of works works for everybody i, I love being in there and just seeing what sort of a, a machine it was and how efficient they they were and how professional they were um that was an amazing experience um how nice all the players were that was so cool how respectful they were that was really 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 cool um well, that was fun but again it, you'd love to see more systems in place um less well, we think this is what the problem is more like go figure it out watch the player move more head to toe but certainly in professional sports it's not always the best way of doing things it's very much this player's costing you money mm -hmm. get them back out there now Leinster wouldn't be as guilty as i'd say like teams in the u.s you know, you, I often hear of basketball teams in the U.S. and it's very much like just inject that player's ankle and get him back out there. 
That's they don't give a shit thought. about the player. Yeah. 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 Where Lancer wasn't that at all. Like the the, the head physio, um, all the physios, they were really like, no, we want to do this properly. We want to actually look after you. To be fair, so, but that was cool to see. Yeah, for sure. But it was intense. Yeah, it was, there were there were big days. You'd be dying afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I'd say like, if, like if you have to do five players in a row for whatever length of time, half an hour, 45 minutes. I mean, like physically you must be in bits after that. Like, yeah, we would do our first couple of days, real trial days. And there were four hours straight, Jesus. which is, it was, yeah, it was, that was nuts. And we're like, okay, is this what it's going to be like? And then when the schedule was brought out, you do a two hour stint and you do two hours straight, which is still really intense and, and crazy, but compared to four hours, like, this is great. It's only half the time. Yeah. Um, so that was cool. It was interesting what it did, though. It made me, you know, when I was in clinic, everything became dig, dig hard, you get loads of soft tissue work for everybody. It's like that, that's, you know, you don't have to do that. And there is too much of, um, in private practice, anyway, too much of an emphasis on that kind of soft tissue work. Everyone needs a massage, and that's what's going to fix people. It's like, nope. It's just going to create this window of opportunity to now input cleaner, healthier movement into somebody. Yeah. That was something that put me off in the past. I went to some people and it was just like excruciatingly painful. Like for me, yeah. my subjective pain level was like 10 out of 10, 11 out of 10. Like it was yeah. <laughs> really uncomfortable. And so the goal, obviously, at the beginning was to get some treatment done so I feel better. And I'd go and do the treatment and yeah, my, my body would feel better for a few days afterwards, but in the long term, it put me off going back for treatment. Yeah, for and, sure. And then also because the approach was like, I'm literally going to stick my elbow in you until the, the knot comes, yeah. <laughs> comes out. Um, and it's like that approach for me just did not work at all because it's like, if I want to do something in the long term, like I want it to work for me. And as well, if you're constantly just going to someone who's sticking their elbow in you and causing a lot of pain and you're noticing the same issue is actually coming back a week or three weeks or four weeks later, it's like, okay, this obviously isn't working. So like, that's no, why I your so. approach, you know, cause it's like, you're actually thinking about what needs to be done. Not like, okay, I'm just going to do this one thing. Cause I do that for. Yeah. Everybody. So we got to be so driven by the why. Mm. It's like, well, why is that muscle tight? What if that muscle is actually inhibited, which is told by the nervous system to calm down, don't produce as much force, protective mechanisms. That muscle will still be tight, be tight as, as tight as a muscle that's overworking. But if you're going to try to dig into that underworking muscle, you've now caused it to either underwork more or you're perpetuating that situation because you didn't just have this thought process. Um, treatment should never be a little bit uncomfortable, but totally bearable. It's really, you should never sweat when you're on a treatment table. For some people that soft tissue stuff works, or if they're training hard for it, that's a big part of it. Listen to a podcast with uh, a triathlete who did really well in the world championships and uh, kind of came out of nowhere, Sam Laidlow. And he loved that soft tissue approach. That was like, yeah, that really, really helped me. Then I would listen to the next podcasts with the two Norwegian triathletes, like you know, number one and two in the world. They never get soft tissue work done at all. No way. They they don't foam roll. They don't get any soft tissue work done. Like, so so individual. Mm -hmm. And the other kind of part that could come with the soft tissue work is that the person is only doing things to you. Yeah. They're in control of, you know, they're fixing you. They're making you better. It's like no, like. But they're, A, they're not, and no one ever is unless they're a surgeon. It's the, you want to facilitate the, the person getting better, the body to kickstart a, a process of feeling better, moving better. Mm -hmm. And that's all we're ever really doing so facilitation. So what way do you facilitate it? Do you drive an elbow into them and you know, cause them to be in a lot of pain and bruising and swearing and hate you? Crying. Or <laughs> crying, crying, definitely. <laughs> Or do we just try to get influenced gently? Mm -hmm. 
it's, I think that's just a much better approach, isn't it? The nervous system goes, oh, okay, I see what you're doing there, but that's cool. Versus getting an elbow mushed into you, the nervous system is going to be like, fuck off. Mm. I'm out of here. Something that I hear a lot from people is, um, and, and even like some therapists and stuff that I've gone, gone to before is like, we need to get the knots out. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. And like, since we started working together and I looked into the neuromuscular side of things a lot more, it's like that just no not people, no, no not. <laughs> so if you want to like, maybe just explain that a little bit for people of like why that may not be true and like what your opinion is around the whole like knots thing. Yeah. I don't know where that all can stem from. You can have tender points and points of tissue of, of tension within a muscle because of a little dysfunction of where but we spoke earlier of that little gap between the nerve and the muscle, you can have a little dysfunction there, too much calcium being released. So you get this small, small contracture, but it gets this word of a knot. Um, I've dissected the human body twice and they were fresh frozen. So there was no embalming, they weren't stiff. They were just like, they just asked. There was no knots. It was, I couldn't see a knot in there anywhere. It wasn't like the wires were all tangled up. It didn't exist. Everything was still smooth um so that we yeah we gotta just dispel that or another one that gets down is like oh scar tissue there's loads of scar tissue it's like did, did you tear it did you tear that muscle no no scar tissue then like it's tender it's not working the way it should but your body's just not going to do that if there's a tear it will it'll, it'll try lay down collagen um so you get that in your know, hamstring tears and ankle tears and things like that or right? ankle sprains but for the majority of us, we don't have these knots. You know, it's, mm -hmm. um, we're we're pretty smooth inside. Yeah, and that's like uh, so. You did work with cadavers, right? So, right. Yeah. So a cadaver is is literally someone who has donated their body to science, and uh, I've never actually. I'm really interested in doing something like that. But like, oh, do you want to so explain? Cool. Like, explain what what that's like you know the setting and and what happens and yeah it is one heck of an experience uh, i was fortunate enough to do it with my old college national training center and john sharkey he's a wonderful anatomist and, and great educator um he's got you know so many people worldwide so he and uh, facilitated that we can go into king's college in london into their dissection rooms and perform dissections and what was really cool was even for the people in King's College, they were used to doing fresh frozen. It's all in bands. And in bands, it doesn't look real. It certainly doesn't smell real. It's gross. <laughs> um, very leathery texture. So just like, this is not real. So uh, they were able to organize fresh frozen. It sounds kind of crazy, doesn't it? And, and gross. But the person, yeah, has said, look, I want my body uh, donated to science. Um, so you can dissect. And so what they'll do is the person passes away, they instantly like, freeze them or they'll freeze a body part. Sounds really crazy, doesn't that? So when they call out and they're left on the table, you just have, like, I think day one was uh, was lower. We had, we had a, a, a leg, we had a tie and a leg for that lower body. And it's just there on a the table. You unwrap it like, you know, it's in butcher's paper almost. And there's a leg, really cold but still as pliable and movable as if as if they were alive right um so you got to you know kind of do your own thing to be honest with you there was a little bit of here's how uh to not use a scalpel everyone did that <laughs> but um so they show you how to how to start to work your way through the tissues and weave and the amazing thing of that was to see fascia which yeah. is your connective tissue that it holds things together in place, but also becomes muscle tissue and becomes tendon and becomes ligament and flows and almost becomes bone. Um, that was amazing to see that. And then knowing that that is highly innervated, so it has loads of neural input um, to and from the body, how important that is. And that just gets cut out all the time, like in surgery and brushed off to the side and mushed. And you're, seeing it in a uh, cadaver is like, oh no, please don't do that. Please put it back where it came from. It has a really important role. Um, so to see how how interconnected we are, 
even on that mechanical level, it's insane. There's like the textbooks are so they're just so not accurate of like there's a muscle, there's a tendon, there's the bone. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, they're just different shades and different densities of the same thing. Yeah. That's all that really is. So where everything just pulls on everything else. And my, my lecturer there, John Sharkey, would always say, How many muscles are in the human body? One. One big one. <laughs> oh, big one. They all connect and they all interplay with one another. They kind of have to. Uh, and, and, and the brain then controls that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something I can't remember who I heard it from, but uh, I'm not sure if it was in Anatomy Trains. And, and there's a the really good book. Um, one of the seminars I went to before, um, the guy who was running at Eugene Tio, he recommended it, but it was by Anatomy Trains. It was all about fascia. Uh, what's it called again? Um, Mer Meridian lines or something like that. Meridian lines, yeah. Um, but um, the analogy was like fascia is like a plastic bag. So just imagine all your shopping that goes in the bag. That's like your muscles and tendons and everything else. Mm -hmm. And and the fascia is everything that that covers it, essentially. Um, well, and, that plastic bag and that fascia actually weaves in through the muscle. As well, as well. Wow. yeah. So it's on top. It's in through it. It's actually on the bone as well, the periosteum of the bone. So you've got this fascia on the bone. It is absolutely everywhere. Wow. And then it's like a plastic bag that has loads of software and technology in it. Mm -hmm. So dense with receptors. So it's hu huge in telling your brain and body where you are in space and time. Your proprioception. It's, it's huge for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's amazing how like, so your brain and your nervous system is, is basically the driver or control and everything that's going on, but you then have your fascia, which interconnects. And I, I would, I did, wasn't even aware that it interconnects. I thought it was just like around. So the fascia goes through everything, your muscles, tendons, bones. Yeah. If you ever get like um, a cooked ham piece of ham, a ham hock, whatnot. And if you start to pull the muscle fibers apart, it's what weirdos like me do and <laughs> stare at it before eating it. There's all this kind of like white, almost cobweb type surface in between. You ever see like, you know, you pull that, you can come just visualize it. Yeah. That's fascia. So you can actually see that it's you start to pull those strands and muscle fibers apart. In between that is the fascia. But yeah. Many people are going to do that now next time they're eating some uh, ham. <laughs> <laughs> if you're vegetarian or vegan, please close your ears. Love to the close your ears and remove that visual from yeah. your, your eyeballs. Um, yeah, it's it's just like so fascinating because like I remember when I was in college, like learning you know about physiology and and stuff like that. That was never covered. So yeah, like there's a serious gap of of knowledge and. And maybe the knowledge gap is there because either the people that are teaching the syllabus or have designed it, maybe they, they aren't actually fully aware of all these things. Maybe, yeah. you know, they haven't done a cadaver course. So they yeah. haven't actually seen the human body as it is, but they've just seen it through a textbook. So they see it in, you know, 2D instead of 3D. For sure. Yeah, so it's really not highlighted, I suppose, because it was always just taught as a, just a bag holding things together so like yeah. whatever do it it's not actually pulling on a tendon we're just pulling on your bone so like it's not moving us it's also kind of hard to define it where we, you can define the bicep muscle yeah you can see it and it has a shape and it has a task and it has a role is this than this <laughs> yeah where that fascia you go how do we name that bit in there kind of hard harder to distinguish maybe yeah, and it's definitely coming around where it's, you know, a lot of stuff is like self myofascial release, muscle and connective tissue release. So that's a that's a um, it's getting there for sure. People, you know, will come into me and be like, "I've heard of this thing called fascia," and I'm like, "Oh, cool! It's great that you've brought that word into clinic, and we get to have that conversation." Mm -hmm. so it's exciting for my nerdy brain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh... That's that's why like I really enjoy anytime we have a session or we get to chat because it's like you know that there's only going to be certain people that you can talk about certain <laughs> with, and then other people are going to be like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, people like yourself, I see you, you people like yourself on my schedule, I'm like awesome. 
we're going it's going to be like a, an amazing session because we get to have extra fun in this yeah. <laughs> we get to talk about fascia and myofascia and proprioception wow awesome <laughs> yeah all that nerdy cool stuff absolutely um, god bless it so I'm interested as well, just to ask about, um, you mentioned, you know, that you're an assistant instructor for neurokinetic therapy. So like, um, if you were to try and describe what neurokinetic therapy is, you know, like, how would you describe that? When we break down the name, the, the creator of neurokinetic therapy, NKT, David Weinstock, like, he put the name together. And it's just such a wonderful name. I wish it was the name of my clinic. Neuro, your nervous system. Um, kinetic movement so it's how your nervous system controls how you move so we're looking at <clears throat> what that brain is signaling to the body and, and vice versa because sometimes the brain will make a decision based on what the muscle or the joints or the ligaments and is telling the brain so it's all these sensory receptors that we're covered in and it's looking at the communication between those it's kind of go back to that if a muscle is tight what is it actually doing? So will it be strong in a test in one of another word? Or will it be weak in a test in one of another word? So facilitated or inhibited or up-regulated or down-regulated. So then they'll both feel tight. So it takes a very simple manual muscle test, which we're all taught pretty much. Just like hold that position, hold strong, push. Yeah, well, it's strong. But it's looking at what if we switched on another muscle or activated another muscle, does it have a knock-on effect now to the muscle that you've just tested? Or if I go, hey, is that strong or weak? Oh, it's weak. It's a good example. Look what I just did with my shoulder. I my shoulder. Like, oh, maybe that neural flow has actually been directed here just before it gets to here. So your body's going to get that attention. So now we know that we start, it opens up pathway. What if I relax this out? Oh, now that switches on cool there's a connection or maybe it doesn't switch it on so then we go okay go check something else so it brings this whole connection of it, that's for me is a real neuromuscular thing that's nerve and muscle and it also goes into tendon and ligaments so that's a real big connection of what neurokinetic therapy brings mm -hmm. it brings a huge amount of don't don't guess like tests don't guess yeah to, to really figure out certain patterns for people and make it so specific for people um and for me as well something like that neurokinetic therapy was uh, it changed movement quicker than i'd seen anything change movement that was my my big um is this good and cool or yeah whatever yeah it was making it an, an impact on object of tests so it's like all right i'm in that that is cool that that works um it would make you more precise it allowed the practitioner to be way more precise onto a structure Mm -hmm. we go it's this structure it's this part of the structure it's right it's in there um, so yeah, that's it's, kind of a it's um and again you know it's just that's one tool in your toolbox of things that you can use and then you yeah you like you can do the test but then you can do other things that you've learned from other systems you know like functional movement systems or or any of the other you know things that you've learned along yeah like hands-on stuff or needling or using tools like in that example there i might have that muscle overworking that's the dominant muscle and it's just getting this muscle to, to down regulation so i got to do something about this and that could be if i'm trained in stretching therapy you know stretch this out until it calms down yeah. manual therapy i'll get my hands on it to calm it down dry needling i'll needle it to calm it down you can use whatever you want, but it also makes allows the practitioner to go back and go, did I actually make a change or not? Because it's one thing about, I feel better. Do you test better? Do you move better? Mm -hmm. Did we actually get some connection in there now? So now, oh, that does work. Because if that was our, you know, we just went on a thought, I might go, oh, it's working here. If I go back into the testing, oh, that still doesn't power up. Well, that wasn't the primary area. Mr. Therapist, go guess again. Go check again. And so it allows, it was similar to functional movement systems and their SFMA, their selective functional movement system, uh, assessment. Go, go check your work. Don't just rub stuff on the table and go, hey, you're good, or I hope you're good, or you should be good. 
mm-hmm. go back and check and make sure you're good. Make sure you've done a good, thorough job. That was one of the lovely things about it. It definitely did. Or, or it was, you know, in college, you'd be like, you rub this line five to seven times, then you move over to here five to seven times. You move it. It's like so everyone needs five to seven times, like three minutes of this. How do you know? NKT would let me actually know because I might get into this for what I think is enough time. Maybe that still is weak. Ah, have another go. A little extra time, a few more minutes. Oh, now it's back up. Okay, you just you needed more time. Mm-hmm. There's a great check system for that. Okay, that's how much I need to spend releasing that muscle. Yeah, that's really cool. And like, I was just thinking on a practical level, like some of the stuff that you gave me before uh, really helped with, you know, my deadlifts. Because when I was focusing on really pushing the deadlift strength, I was ending up getting, you know, uh, a lot of tightness with my uh, rectors, my lower back and my QL and stuff. So you'd given me kind of like two or three specific things to do. And like the first thing was like, get a ball and literally just like massage the erectors from bottom to top. And then there was one or two other movements. I think there's like a, a bird dog and and maybe there was one other thing, but I remember, you know, my lower back wouldn't feel great. And then I would do all that stuff. And then the deadlift numbers were, were going up, Yeah, and, you know, ended up hitting a PR of like uh, 237.5 and That's crazy, man. Not That's awesome. Good no belts either so wow like the the lower back strength the core strength was was there and it it was doing those two or three things beforehand that was like when i get into the sets going heavier like oh this actually feels really good now like it's nice it's being given what it needs you know to be whatever more switched on or fired up or however you want to describe Hmm. it yeah it's that being so specific so my, my question when you were releasing your erectors the back here do you remember what muscle you had to then power on and fire up right i I can't remember it was a couple (laughs) years ago but um yeah i remember the exact difference you know so that's the thing it's like you can't just massage or something and you can't just only try switch on and activate or something they're Mm -hmm. they're out of balance you got to bring them back into balance that's it it's a huge help to know that and to know that okay you are on the right track and have those systems to go you're on the right track so you can see things yeah. getting better the exercise is getting better and then your your number is getting better or your ability to train to get those numbers better mm-hmm. so win, yeah. window of opportunity yeah i think um just speaking personally i think my body responds quite well to light massage in in general areas because i did that with my lower back when i spray my wrist recently i was thinking like what's worked for me well in the past when i worked with john it's like oh it's always been doing some type of light massage so where i spray my wrist kind of around there i I can't remember what that bone is called but i'd literally just go like this with my finger and massage for like 30 seconds and then as i was gradually building up the wrist strength and and getting back to doing push-ups literally doing that uh would reduce the pain in my wrist from like a five out of ten to like a two out of ten and rubbing works on a lot of things so a lot of our receptors our sensory receptors te- temporarily respond to rubbing do to, to ever see a, a receptor chart so what they actually will calm down for loads of it is like rubbing Rubbing and uh, deep pressure, rubbing, deep pressure, rubbing, like the chart of because rubbing, deep pressure, rubbing, 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 deep pressure. And when you think about it, you, if you're walking around your house and you bang your elbow off the wall or the um, the door frame, your first thing ah, you say, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it does make things better. It's that the sensory interaction uh, to the skin, but you're also bringing some blood flow into an area as well. Um, and in certain circumstances for yours for your wrist you're actually stimulating a little bit of inflammation so you're actually kicking off a little bit of inflammation to help push it along and move it through so that it can actually heal it's a real natural reaction though isn't it just rub it (laughs) yeah it's amazing but it's like you wouldn't like i would never would have thought about it that way like obviously if i bang my elbow off something like i'd rub it straight away but that's like a subconscious thing that's happening yeah but 
but now because I know that that works for me, it's like I can do that for any area. It's like that's cool. Uh, the other day I was doing hamstring curls and I literally just like rubbed my hamstrings and gave them a massage for like 20 seconds mm. and then hopped back in as I was going heavier. And like it just felt so much better. And it works oh, for, so- for every muscle group for me for, for some reason. Oh, that's so cool. Um, so it's, and, it's- and these things can happen. You know, we get these small little twinges and tweaks and they can be. I don't think anything's really random, but it can seem random to our conscious brain. And if it's only been like a day or whatever, it's like, yeah, just, just give it a rub. It mm-hmm. may just pass. Remember, cool. We don't need to make a mountain out of it. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I know uh, we've been talking for a while. It's been like an hour and 20. Um, oh, and... That flew, dude. I thought it was 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I want to do before we finish up is just do some quick fire questions. All right. I love it. Awesome. So literally, like first thing that comes to your mind, just say it. Okay, um, dokie. Uh, this could be rough. <laughs> <laughs> they're all they're all normal, nice questions. Not, not okay. all. all right. So question one, what is your favorite dessert? Ice cream. What particular type? Hagen Das. Pralines and cream, Hagen Das. Nice. All right. What's I your... could eat a whole tub of that. You're you're you've got one meal to eat, and it's gonna be your last meal you ever have. What's it gonna be? Uh steak and pizza, all on the one plate. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What's your favorite sport to watch? Ooh, basketball. And favorite sport to compete in? Triathlon. Nice. Um Favorite holiday destination that you've been to or holiday you've been on? Oh, New York. New York City all the way. Nice. Uh, your favorite way to chillax? Reading or being by the sea, actually. The sea. Just send me to the sea. Uh, favorite musical artist or favorite musical genre? Genre. I'm a real grunge rocker head. I used to have long hair when I had hair. <laughs> so uh yeah kind of nirvana sonic UP kind of stuff uh favorite tv show i barely watch tv but uh a huge seinfeld fan going old school with that one nice favorite film Whew. i would have no idea i'm so not a movie guy oh really <laughs> yeah i'm like yeah it's cool whatever um, I'm going to say a really old, like Ghostbusters 2. <laughs> uh, someone that you're a big fan of. Someone that I'm a big fan of. Oh my God, there's so many people. Um, maybe professionally, Great Cook. Physical therapist from the US. I think he's, he's, he's cool. Very smart guy, but so down to earth. Uh, yeah, he's awesome. Great Cook. Amazing. Last one. Uh, what would you say your favorite book is? Um, it's Movement by Gray Cook. <laughs> shout out to Gray if you're watching this. <laughs> so shout out. We'll tag him in. That's a brilliant book. I do I do like kind of nerding out. That's my, I, I struggle with like oh, reading fiction. Just doesn't do it for me. Mm-hmm. I'll happily read about clinic, clinical work or business work. And that's my chill. Amazing. Good stuff. Uh, well, it's been great to chat, John. Really appreciate your time. Um, I'll end the recording and then we can have a quick chat after. But um, yeah, thanks. Thank so you much. so much. Oh, thanks for having me on, Elon. Love the chats. I always love when we, this is a good proper catch up. So yeah, no, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, thank you. Speak soon. Talk to you soon.